parts of the Holy Spirit. What he actually has to do with uh, both the things of, of Christ and his salvation as well as uh, his works involved with us. And also, uh, to let you know that on Wednesday nights we just finished our study on angels and uh, learned a lot about uh, uh, angels. We found out that they are all through the Bible from beginning to, get, from beginning to end involved in everything to do with the kingdom of God. Uh, this Wednesday night, uh, we're going to begin a new study. We're going to be talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, God gives us gifts for the purpose of uh, fulfilling our calling and ministry and confirming the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's a good uh, study, good information to have. And so I want to invite all of you out to be here on Wednesday nights for Bible study as we learn more about the things that God has done for us. Now as we look at the work of the Holy Spirit, we find that the Holy Spirit has been active in every dispensation. He has been present wherever God has been revealed. The Holy Spirit has been revealed with uh, them. We find that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work in unison. They work together uh, for God's kingdom purposes. In most cases, divine works originate with the Father. It is the Father's will. It is the Father's work. And then they are carried out through the Son. Jesus is the one who has provided the means for the work to be done. And then they are manifested or brought into being by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the executor of God's will. He carries out the things that God wills to be done, uh, both uh, individually, corporately, and around the world. Everything to do with the kingdom of God are brought to fruition by the Holy Spirit. So as we look at the works of the Holy Spirit, we will do so as they relate to the universe as a whole, uh, to the unsaved, to Jesus Christ, and as well as to the believer. I want to begin by looking at how the Holy Spirit relates to the world in general, to God's creation. As far as the material universe, the Holy Spirit was an agent in the creation at the beginning. In fact, we find each person of the Godhead was involved when God created uh, the earth, the animals, the trees, the seas, the us. Everything that God created in the beginning, we find that the Father was there, Jesus was there, and the Holy Spirit were there. In uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, he says, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. In verse 2, he says, Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heirs of all things, through whom also he made the world. So we can see that the world were made through Christ. He was actively involved in the creation of the earth and all the planets, the stars, the sun, the moon. He was actively involved in those things. In John chapter 1, verse 3, he says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In Psalms 140, verse 30, he says, You send forth your spirit, and they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. So here we can see that Jesus was actively involved in the creation of everything, but the Holy Spirit is the one who actually comes and brings these things into being. He is the one that creates, that uh, carries out this will of God. So all three are working together to bring about the divine will of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we see from the very beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, uh, we'll find that the word God that is used in Genesis 1, 1 is actually in the plural. It is speaking about the plurality of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all there in Genesis 1, 1 uh, to bring about God's creation. And they were all active in that creation. In Genesis chapter 1, we find the creation of, of three distinct kingdoms that took place. The heavens and the earth, the animal life, and human life. 
We find the Holy Spirit was present in the creation of each of these kingdoms. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, he says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In other words, the Holy Spirit was there, hovering over the creation as God was bringing it forth. In Job chapter 26, verse 13, he says, By his Spirit he adorned the heavens. In other words, when God brought the heavens into being, he brought the planets, the stars, and all of them into being, the Holy Spirit was there adorning the heavens. He was the one that was actually bringing these things into being. In Psalms 33, 6, he says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now, what is the breath of God's mouth? It is brought forth by the Holy Spirit. In Psalms 104, verse 24, talking about animal life, he says, O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea, in which are innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great. There the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan, which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open their hand, uh, your hand, and they are filled with good. You hide your face, and they are troubled. You take away their breath, and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. Again, talking about the Holy Spirit is the one who creates all of these things. And the breath of the Almighty, uh, and, and he says, you, they are created and to renew the face of the earth. So the Spirit of God is, is actively involved in all of everything that's created. And then concerning us and human life, in Job 33, 4, he says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. And God created Adam and Eve. When he created mankind, he did it through the work of the Holy Spirit, and he breathed the Spirit into us that we might live and exist in this creation. And then we see the Holy Spirit actively involved when we look at humanity as a whole. The Holy Spirit witnesses to the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. He was present to see the plan of God unfold concerning the salvation of mankind. In Acts chapter 5, verse 30 to 32, he says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and, and remission of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The Holy Spirit is a witness to the redeeming work of God. And the Holy Spirit comes unto us, to all those who will obey the word of God. In John chapter 16, verse 8 through 11, we see that the Holy Spirit is the one who initiates the work of God to bring us to himself. In John 16, 8 through 11, he says, When he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Remember, salvation can only come through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance is the result of conviction. We must be brought to a recognition of our sinfulness, that we need a Savior. We need somebody to deliver us from sin. And the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the world of sin. Every one of us that have been born again had an encounter whereby the Holy Spirit showed us our sinfulness and brought us to a place through that conviction of the Holy Spirit whereby we were given the gift of God to repent and to forsake our sin. And that same Holy Spirit is the one who gives us, produces that faith in us 
as reveals Christ to us. He convicts of sin because no man can produce the conviction in the heart of somebody else. Only God can produce conviction. Only the Holy Spirit can break through the blindness and deceitfulness of the sinful heart and bring us to a realization of how great a sinner we are, how great is our iniquity and guilt in the sight of a holy God. The primary sin that the Holy Spirit convicts us of is the sin of unbelief, of our failure to recognize Jesus as our Savior and to put our faith in Him. When the world stands before God in the judgment, that's the only sin that they need to send them to hell. Because Jesus Christ is the only way to get into the grace of God to receive this great salvation. And without that faith in Christ, there is no salvation. As long as the sin of unbelief remains, so do all other sins remain until we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We were born in sin, and that sin resides within us until we put our faith in Jesus Christ. When we repent and believe in Him, He removes the sin from us to make us into a new creation so we can be born again in the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit convicts of righteousness. He is talking here about the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is attested to by the fact of Christ's resurrection and ascension of the Father. In other words, Jesus lived a life of perfect righteousness. He is the example of what righteousness is. And it was proven by the fact that God raised him up from the dead and received him back into heaven because his righteousness was sufficient to provide a salvation for us. If Jesus was a liar and an imposter, the Father would never have received him back into heaven. God's acceptance proves that Christ's innocence, that Christ's righteousness the, uh, uh, was enough to fulfill God's uh, uh, judgment against sin. So in this sense, the Holy Spirit provides evidence to the world that, Christ is, that in Christ is found the righteousness that we need in order to provide for our own salvation. Again, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, uh, Jesus said that if our righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. That righteousness is that righteousness which we receive through the blood of Jesus Christ. When we take upon the divine nature upon ourselves, we receive His righteousness so that we uh, can get into heaven with him. And then he tells us the Holy Spirit convicts of judgment. Satan is the ruler of this fallen world, and he has already been judged by Jesus Christ. That he is judged means that all those who reject Christ remain under the power of Satan and are judged with him. We've been looking at through the scriptures over the months. Uh, we see that uh, when Jesus redeems us, he not only redeems us from sin, he redeems us from the power of Satan. Because all of those that live in this life under the lust of the flesh and the power of sin are also under the power of Satan. And uh, as long as we're under the power of Satan, then we're going to uh, receive the same judgment that Satan is going to receive. In John chapter 12, verse 31, he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. That's Jesus talking about the judgment of Satan. And then we look at the Holy Spirit in relationship to Jesus Christ. The Bible begins by revealing God as existing. In Genesis 1-1, he says, in the beginning, God. That's it. There's no explanation of where he came from, or just says, in the beginning, God. And that's because God has always been, always will be. He's eternal. He has no beginning, no ending. He just is. God exists. We're not given an explanation, and there's no attempt made to account for God's existence. 
He's just simply revealed as being. And we see the revelation that God exists by looking at his creation. One of the greatest proofs that God exists is the order that we see in this creation. You have to have somebody to produce order in order to have order. In other words, when we look at the way everything is aligned, we just consider the earth, the way it rotates, the distance it is from the sun, everything about it, if it was not exactly positioned the way it is, life could not exist on this planet. In fact, if the earth were to move out of its orbit, orbit, if it got a little bit closer to the sun, we'd all burn up. If it got a little further from the sun, we'd all freeze to death. Everything has divine order. If you don't believe that, take a couple hours sometime when you're alone and just stare at your hand. Just stare at it and look at what it can do, how it operates, the perfection, what it took to make this hand do, be able to do what it can do. And think about that. How can it exist unless somebody designed and ordered these things? That's the proof that God is real. Just look at creation. Look how everything functions perfectly together. There's no way that that can exist by chance. In fact, to believe, to deny God, and to believe that everything is random takes a whole lot more faith than it does to believe that somebody designed everything in creation with a perfect order so everything could exist the way it does. In Hebrews chapter 1, Verse 1 through 3, he tells us God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, and being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So again, God tells us, not only uh, 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 can we believe that God pre uh, is and exists and is who he says he is because of the order that we see, but he also said his son to make him known. He speaks to us through Jesus Christ. That's why we have this word, uh, the Bible, that tells us the things that Jesus did upon this earth and the things that he spoke. So we can know God through his Son. In John 14, 9, he says, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is telling us when we see him, we see the Father. When we know Jesus, we can know what God is like. Because Jesus is God. And he represents the Father in a perfect way. Amen? So if we know Jesus, we know God. God gives us a progressive revelation. In the same way, the Son reveals the Father, the Holy Spirit reveals the Son. In John 16, verse 13 through 15, Jesus says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Remember what Jesus said, I am the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now listen to what Jesus said. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. We can see that God reveals himself through the Son and then through the Holy Spirit. So from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit so that we can know the Son and knowing the Son we can know the Father. So the Holy Spirit is integrally involved 
in us knowing who God is and knowing who Jesus is. Now we want to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ, especially in his humanity, to see the inner working of God as revealed uh, to us. The Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit was involved in the sending of Christ into the world. In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16, he said, Come near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. The Holy Spirit was involved in Christ coming in the flesh upon this earth as the Son of God to reveal God to us. Christ has existed through all eternity. But only in the last 2,000 years did he come forth in the flesh to visit men. The Holy Spirit was involved in the sending process along with the Father. And again, the purpose was that we could know God in a real and practical way. The Holy Spirit conceived Christ. In Luke 135, the angel answered and said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Jesus could not be born of man, because the seed of man is corrupt. If Jesus had been born of the seed of Joseph, he would have been born a sinner just like us. And as a sinner, he could not be a perfect sacrifice to provide atonement for our sins. So Jesus had to be born apart from the seed of man. So he was born of the seed of God by the way of the Holy Spirit. That's why we declare Jesus Christ to be fully man and fully God. He was born of the egg of Mary, but of the seed of God. And so we have God and man coming together in Jesus Christ. But we can see that the Holy Spirit was the one that was involved in this conception. In uh, Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 20, But while he thought upon these things, talking about Joseph, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, and he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Again, telling us that Jesus was birthed by the seed of God himself. Christ's conception was not like that of other human beings because he always existed. God has always been. He just is. He was not conceived as a human personality, but of a human nature. By his conception, he entered into vital relationship with human nature so that he could identify with us, that he could share in our humanity and thereby become a savior that we can identify with because he identifies with us. His personality has always been and always will be Jesus, the Christ, the Eternal One, the Son of God. And for this reason, the Holy Spirit brought about the conception of Christ in the womb of Mary. The Holy Spirit arranged Christ's reception in the temple after his birth. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 30, he tells us, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for the coming of God's promise to send them a deliverer. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. So the Holy Spirit not only brought about the conception of Christ, but he was also there to bring about Christ coming to the temple to be dedicated to God. 
according to the law. The Holy Spirit both witnessed to Simeon to tell him to give him a prophetic word that he would see the Christ before he died. And he also moved Simeon to be at the temple exactly when Joseph and Mary brought the Christ child. Everything about it was divinely uh, appointed, everything about it was divinely directed and ordered by God through the working of his Holy Spirit to make sure that everything came about exactly as God had ordered it. That's the kind of God we serve. He is integrally involved in everything in his creation, and he is integrally involved in everything to do with us to make sure that everything goes as planned. That's why when we look at what's happening in the world today, when we look at what's happening in America and Israel and these nations, we have faith that God is still in control and everything that is happening is under the eye of God and ultimately we will see that everything that is taking place in this creation is going to bring about God's will and purpose and plan to bring about His kingdom and bring about everything that He has ordained from before creation ever existed. All of this was part of God's providential participation in the affairs of men to bring about that plan and purpose. And then we find that as Jesus began to grow, began to develop as a child, that the Holy Spirit was responsible for his growth. In Luke chapter 2, verse 40, he says the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. You have to remember, Jesus was not created as an adult, as Adam was, but he was created, rather, in a way that he had to grow and develop just as any of us, with the exception that he did not possess a sin nature. And the development of Christ as he grew into adulthood was rapid and directed to God as we find him in the temple at the age of 12 years old, talking with the scribes and the Pharisees and showing the greatness of his power, of his understanding of the scriptures, showing them his wisdom. His humanity developed, his abilities increased under the work of the Holy Spirit being with him as he grew. That's why when his parents came looking for him, he says, did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? The Holy Spirit was involved in his development. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11, verse 1, he says, there shall come forth a rock from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. They rested upon Christ as he grew and developed so that he would be led in all the will and purpose of God and he would grow up to be the purpose of God sending him to be our Savior, to have the wisdom, the knowledge, and everything that he needed to do what needed to be done for us. I'm going to cut it off here and we will pick up on this next week. But it's important to understand and to see how the Holy Spirit was involved in everything that God does. And as we move beyond how he was involved in everything with Christ from beginning to end, from his birth to his resurrection, from his pre-birth to his, to his uh, uh, ascension into heaven, the Holy Spirit was involved in everything to do with Christ. We're going to find out also that he's also involved in everything to do with the church. Everything to do with our salvation from beginning to end, from birth to death. The Holy Spirit is involved in everything, and that's why we need to know who He is and what He does. And we can know Him in a personal and intimate way and become the people that God has called us to be and do the things that God has called us to do. Amen. Let's pray. And as we pray this morning, I'd like to give you the opportunity to hear this morning. Again, I want to open the altar. If the Lord is speaking to you, if you need prayer, if you just need to.
come before God. Uh, he, he's dealing with you in anything in your life. This is the opportunity to do that. And, uh, and even as we, we speak about the Holy Spirit, his involvement in everything to do with us and the church, maybe you need to ask God to bring you to a place to receive the things that Christ has done for us that you too might have the Holy Spirit in your life and working in you. So I just want to open that up. If you need to come to the altar, you can do so. Father, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you, O oh God, that you saw fit, that you would not leave us alone after the birth of your church on this earth. But you have sent to us the same one that you sent to your son to help him fulfill his ministry and calling upon this earth. You have sent him to your church to help us continue that mission and do the things that you would have us to do. That everything we do with God would not be by our power or our wisdom, not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit whom you have given to us. God, I pray, as we get an ever-growing understanding of who Holy Spirit is and what he does, that we also would come into a greater intimacy, a greater fellowship, to know him, to not only have the Holy Spirit, but to walk in the Holy Spirit, to walk as Jesus walked, being led by the Spirit of God, in everything that you desire to do in us and through us. That we'll be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. That we'll be conscious of your Holy Spirit as we live out this life upon this earth. We'll be sensitive to his touch, to his conviction. We'll be sensitive to his direction. We'll have clear hearing of his voice. To know his voice, to hear his voice, to follow his voice, to heed his voice. We will truly be a church, a people of the Word and the Spirit. And that we will depend upon Him in everything we do, so that everything we do will be pleasing in your sight, not done in our strength, but done by the power of the Holy Spirit. So teach us, O oh God, as we go through your Word, and open our hearts and minds to hear and to heed this great gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for it, O oh God. We give you all praise and glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, as we go out of this place this morning, we pray, O oh God, that you continue to watch over us and be with us. Direct us in your will and purpose, O oh God. Keep us in your grace and mercy. Cover us with your hands. Surround us with your angels. And Lord, help us to grow in our spiritual walk and word, to be in prayer, to be in worship to be giving, to be serving. Lord, to be the people that you have bought and paid to be. And we thank you for these things. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.